Welcome to the Data Coffee Break podcast. I'm Mark. And I'm Christian. If you are passionate about data like us, take a seat, relax, and join us to our coffee break where we discuss all things data. And remember, there are no filters, no PR. It's just a real life experience. So let's begin. What an excited time of the year. So actually, we are in December, but yes. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. We know that uh, has been a very uh, interesting and uh, exciting uh, 2022 year. And we want to bring you today uh, much more excitement for what's coming up for this year. What's up, uh, Christian? Yes, as per usual, every episode, I'm super excited. But today in particular is freezing. In London. <laughs> yeah. We're recording at home today. <laughs> I really like these episodes that we do in, in person, right? Of course, we're always drinking during those episodes, but really looking forward for today. And we have a super guest. We're super excited about that. Welcome, Ivan. How are you doing? I'm very good. Thank you so much, uh, guys, for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah. So for a lot of people who don't know Ivan, if you don't see Ivan on TikTok, <laughs> on Instagram, <laughs> on LinkedIn, so Ivan been a colleague of us uh, at Tableau. Uh, he moved on to another company, but he's still a very close friend of us and um, a person where we always speak data, basically, when we're together. So that's why we thought it, it would be very interesting to have you here today. Ivan is... One of the most engaging persons that you will ever meet when doing a demo. Yeah. You have worked as a pre-sales engineer for more than six years, started yourself as a innovator researcher. Yes, and yes. You also have a, a title for biomedical engineering. Can you tell us about that? Yes. So I did my degree in bioengineering. I'm very much into sort of biotech and genetic engineering. And I thought that was going to be my career. Then nice. I started working in a lab. I realized that wasn't really for me. And so my entire career is full of vertical moves until I fell into pre-sales. Yes. And as, well, the three of us here, but also I imagine a lot of people hearing us, pre-sales is one of those places where you fall and you fall in love. And that's what happened to me. Amazing. What are we going to be covering today, Mark? Well, New Year, we thought it could be very interesting to look about trends in a data world. So today we are addressing the top data trends. We're actually not going to give a specific numbers right now, how many data trends. So let's let's see how many we come up with. Mm -hmm. We will give those uh, links in the description of this episode yes. and just share our point of view, what we think about those one, if we think they're genuine, if we think they're actually has been, they're actually behind us, or if it's actually true data trends that uh, we should invest on and look and be excited about. Buzzword alert. <laughs> <laughs> All the buzzwords. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's get started. The first one will be around uh, data mesh and data fabric. Does it inspire you? <laughs> well, that's a good question, right? So I think out of this list, uh, this is one of those that is not a technology, but rather a framework. Let's start by defining it. Yeah, quite a lot of people might not be aware of this one. What, how do you define a data mesh? Actually, the other day I was with a customer and they mentioned that they asked 10 data engineers about what data mesh is and everyone came with a different <laughs> with, a, with a different answer to that. Completely. As I try to understand better data mesh, I realize because it is a framework, not a technology, it can mean a lot of different things. Exactly. Actually, I ended up asking chat GTP, can you tell me what you think data mesh is? <laughs> <laughs> and what did it came with? Well, with a collection of products and services within an yes. organization to provide all of the data needs. So separation between different, a company might actually leverage different technologies at different points in time and you access them as a service and as a product within the organization. That's how ChatGTP defined it. And I actually quite like that definition because at least from the years I was working in data, it's a separate trend because the trend yeah. I was looking is further and further centralization of the data technologies into a data pipeline. And this feels more like less of a data pipeline, but less sort of yeah. request points. At least that's how I understand it. A hundred percent. I think data mesh is also there to address the data silos. Mm -hmm. And the framework without getting that scientific about it is about having these multifunctional teams within the organization. Mm -hmm. So exactly. in the context of data, traditionally you have an IT central function 
function that is in charge of delivering data to other parts of the business, call it HR, uh, marketing, finance. Yeah. And the idea of doing those products that you mentioned is that not only creating the products, technically speaking, but actually transforming the way uh, that your organization works with data by adding those data engineering skills within, yeah. for example, HR, marketing. Mm -hmm. So that's actually quite a disruptive paradigm. I don't think it's for every yeah. company or not all companies no, are ready for that. I think it's... It should be considered as a trend in my yes. point of view for 2023. But when we speak about data mesh, we should always consider having like the data literacy yeah. within the teams. That's why you say not every company. If a company is having already put in place yeah. methodology and learning for every single business user mm -hmm. to be able to, to leverage yes. data, data mesh can be used and it can be very good and very successful, but limited in terms of the number of companies in my point of view. Completely. I mean, we're talking at the top level, but the, the way that sort of I frame it in my head, the data mesh is that in traditional companies where we feel we've accessed the problem of data literacy, then our access point for business units is the BI team. Okay. So that's where marketing, HR, accesses data. They access data through that interface whilst opening it up to maybe this is a data engineering problem. This is a data engineering request. So we, we bring the subject matter experts directly to the side of the data pipeline where they the need is, which is not necessarily just BI. The other thing that I would add is the concept of hub and spoke. And the concept mm -hmm. of hub and spoke is that you have that central core team that I do believe that you will never get rid of. So you have someone mm -hmm. governing the access. And I guess during today's trend list, we're going to see that in my opinion, we are going now back to moving the data preparation or data creation to the data engineering teams. Okay, perfect. Thanks for your point of view on that. Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> I think if we continue in that pace, like we, it is going to be an hour and a half. Uh, episode. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, second one, real-time analytics. I have my take on that because from my point of view in my job, I have many clients requesting for that. And more and more, they don't know always what they want exactly when we speak about real-time analytics, which is a problem. But mm -hmm. this is a request coming more and more. And there are technologies now, I would say, that are quite mature to enable that. I don't know if it could really kickstart at becoming very something very big this year in 2023, but I could be developing much more than it used to be in many of those technologies and companies. I don't remember if it was Gartner or one of those that say that by 2025, all data will be considered real time. And I guess that takes us to what does real time really mean? Mm -hmm. For example, we can see a tweet or a Facebook post or a TikTok really being real time. And we are trying to equate this on the enterprise side, but you will not have that need all uh, for every single use case. What do you think, Ivan, in your experience, what real time means? I completely agree. And I actually, I would not call it even real time analytics. I would call it real time data. Yeah. I've been asked time and time again, how do I do this in real time? And my, a lot of the times my question is, can you make decisions and pivot on the analytics that you're getting, on the insights that you're getting Correct. in real time? Because if the answer is no, then why does it need to be real time? There's, I find there's such a small amount of use cases in which the difference between real time, near real time, or even things like one day delay approaches more the human time frame of making decisions or, and pivoting what you're making. So it is definitely a trend. The same way that a few years ago, big data was a trend. Everyone was like, I want my data to be so big. I want my data to be so fast. Why? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that can be linked to basically the point, okay, real time, no problem. But can you have, in this case, human cannot really make decision, as you say, mm -hmm. in real time. So can you have automation that basically make decision for you in real time yes. yeah, or make action in real time? That's when real time analytics becomes like very relevant. My take on this is that real time analytics, I really have a conflict with that because real time information shouldn't be a workflow where a human is involved. If it's something that is automated, such as, for example, a fraud transaction, right? So you get that in real time, that but there was no human interaction, right? So therefore, there is no really analytics on top of it. But definitely a trend. Cool. Next one. Uh, Christian, I put you on the spot. Data as a service can be shortened as DAS. 
How do you define it in your point of view? Right. Well, between us, we already closed the page that I had in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the point is that I needed to search for it because to me, data as a service, I mean, why we want to make everything as a service? But the definition that we have is all about outsourcing your data collection to a third party. Mm. So you receive the data as a service, but that to me sounds more like a marketplace, yeah. Yeah. more like a monetizing your data. My point of view is that this already exists, but I think the trend here is that all of your data is going to be like that, which I don't think it's something achievable. Yeah, because as you say, it's already a thing. Um, we had an episode with Alex Lokov when it comes to alternative data, which is basically data as a service. We know many tools in the market already offer this kind of marketplace, yeah. you know, the like of Snowflake, for example. I don't know. Is there anything more on that? As you say, maybe internally, in this case, data as a service from a company perspective. I think it's all about reducing the time from data collection to mm. database insight. I mean, I have you ever had a customer that you can really have all of your data to a third party? I don't know. That I, I really, I'm really conflicted about this. First, because there's the eye roll of like, everything has to be as a service right now, which is such an industry buzzword. Not everything can be a service, people. Maybe a small organization that does not have the skills in-house yeah. to have data collection, data engineering, data preparation, and data analytics. That's the only point where I would see the full outsource of a data pipeline. But yeah, data as a service, I'm not sold. Debatable data trend in this case, yeah. yeah. All right, next one. Data governance or data security analysis with big data. Any take on that? If data governance is a trend for you, then you have more serious problems right now. So not a trend. It's already something that should be part of day-to-day yes. -day organizations. Okay, so next one in this case. Semantic layer and metrics layer. Oh, that's very controversial if you ask me because first okay. of all, I have a bias. Okay, so um, there was a product uh, like a once upon a time. <laughs> Back in the day, there was a semantic layer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it depends on how you see the semantic layer playing here, right? So my personal opinion here, right? The semantic layer that existed back then, that universe or those cubes or um, data model for OBIE, we removed that completely to give uh, the data analytics responsibility of creating some those models. Mm -hmm. Then, yeah. in my personal experience, and again, just take it like this because I have a bit of a bias where I'm working at the moment, I can see that Looker came back to address that mm -hmm. issue, right? To say, actually, it wasn't the best idea that you give all this responsibility to data analysts because I'm lacking governance. And that semantic layer that Looker created was also to support not only a visualization tool, but also data applications or API. That's a bit of a story, right? So yeah. what is a semantic layer or the metrics layer now? Is that single place where you define all your enterprise KPI definitions that can be uh, consumed by a BI tool, by a data app? Now, why is this a trend if this product existed like a few years ago. I believe that it has to do with the fact that it's very, it was very difficult to get hold of it. I think it's coming back in this case since, and you pointed out, the aspect of data apps as it's yes. becoming more and more ubiquitous to access data through different means. And you want to have like a central definition of your data. At the time, as we were explaining with previous tools, that was only bound to a specific system specific bi reporting tool now it's more ubiquitous for the entire data stack i would say yeah and now it's being also um tool agnostic correct yeah. to be honest at this point there may be lots of players there one that it's bringing this as a trend or pushing this as a trend i see is dbt semantic layer by itself is not a trend like as you said it's uh, we've been talking about semantic layers for for years but it's almost like we came full circle because semantic layers were a very solid process that was quite hard to iterate upon and i think that's what we not only is the agnosticity which is extremely important and it goes back to the idea of the data mesh i feel the idea of connecting the uh, subject matter experts with the definition of the kpis and being able to iterate through them but also the possibility of using different tech stacks that support that the trend that we've seen uh and very much led by the democratization of, of bi of having those definitions being locked down to one specific data product that might have some subject matter experts in play, but that those KPIs are not shared yeah. across the organization. True. It just doesn't provide a common language to speaking about data, even though it 
it facilitates having that other side of the coin of having those subject matter experts more involved. And we're going back to the other side of the coin by facilitating the layer of abstraction that's agnostic to tech stack, but also by facilitating the interaction with the subject matter experts that are defining those KPIs. It doesn't matter if it's 100 data products or 1,000 data products, they're all speaking the same language. And that's the benefit of having something like a, a semantic layer, is the capacity to iterate and quickly change what those KPI calculations might be. All right, next one will be natural language processing. I obviously see a lot of products integrating NLP in their technologies. Uh, we saw also a lot of consumer products doing that. Um, Ivan was speaking about uh, chat uh, GPT <laughs> being a trend at the moment on that. This is rising. I think the computer power really enables to do fantastic thing on that. The integration on technologies is up to grab, uh, I would say, in many of those uh, platforms. Well, natural language processing is a trend, mm -hmm. not in data. It's a trend, period. It's about lowering the technical barrier for access to technology. So in the case of data, it's all about facilitating the access to data analytics yeah. through natural language. I have my issues with the trend of natural language processing because, as we've seen time and time again, it extremely focuses in English. That, that, for me, can't be considered a trend because it's been years since we've seen natural language processing in the data space Absolutely. and we're yet to see another language that isn't English in it. It is a trend for sure because yes, we want to ask Alexa what are my sales this quarter and have an answer. Um, it's just what's happening across every single tech industry. Do I feel it's groundbreaking for data? No. I personally don't see what's exciting about it. You're right. I think I would question if something that has been a trend for so long should be considered still a trend, right? I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, if you consider... It can I mean, rise and rise. <laughs> yes. But as you mentioned there, Mark, I mean, with ChatGPT, I mean, it seems that it's again back into yeah. everyone's domain. But ChatGPT is interesting because it processes the data, in the language input. Mm -hmm. Well, and it processes the data output by looking at all this unstructured data and collecting an analysis out of it. That's the side that's impressive, the processing of unstructured data. The fact that it can recognize the questions that I ask, that's something we've seen already for a few years, the, yeah. the interpretation of the natural language input. Again, I'll be impressed when I see that happening in Portuguese mm -hmm. Or I see that happening in other languages besides English. That's because then then we're going to really be talking about democratization of, of natural language processing. Right now, it's the output that I'm excited about, not the input. I think the problem we might have with NLP is the access points for the users. Mm -hmm. We, we touch a little bit on data apps where now it's going to be more diffuse into the life of business users and consumers. And we already have that. If you open your, your banking app, for example, now you have visualization, uh, you have analytics on your data. I think the trend where it could be really rise is, yes, as you said, like language equivalents, I mean, support to multiple languages, but making sure it's available where the user needs it. Because at the moment, in a lot of technologies is as part of the platform. The goal of NLP is to help users and lower the barrier of analytics. And mm -hmm. it's always part of a specific data platform, a specific technology where those users are not likely to go anyway. Quick one. If you are enjoying this episode and our show, please make sure you follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Links are the description as per usual. Also, if you'd like to grow this community with us, Think about sharing this episode with a friend or a colleague interested about all things data. Now, back to the episode. Data contracts. Christian has a lot to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> that, means, that basically means we're not really sure what it means. <laughs> there is this really good thought leader. His name is Chad Sanderson, LinkedIn. He's the one that I have seen the most. Talking about it, even in the, in the analytics engineering podcast, he went there and talked about data contracts. But data contracts, to me, is, is a way that you can bring what we have already established over the years with external APIs into the organization. I'm just going to be very specific on an example. You have a pipeline of data and then suddenly one day the pipeline fails. And the reason why that fail is because the source system, you want to call it your CRM or your ERP, ended up changing the, the column type without telling you mm -hmm. or adding an extra column oh, or yeah. simply not refreshing the data when it's supposed to be. Now, when you 
going to, for example, get data from Salesforce, you have a data contract there in a way, not something that you signed, perhaps, but you have a promise from Salesforce that mm -hmm. you have all fully documented and it's going to be a change. You get acknowledged beforehand, similar to other, with any other tool, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, I'm not talking the data contracts exactly in API, I'm just talking about an, an example of how you, it's being used at the moment is bringing the lessons learned into the business. So within your teams, you can actually bring some skin in the game from people that are producing data for your teams. So for example, if you are the person that is maintaining the dashboards of your organization, you may have a data contract with yeah, those yeah. teams that are providing you with the data. And again, I believe that this is a good trend because you bring some skin in the game before people that are producing the data, right? So what happens if the data is not fresh, mm -hmm. some SLAs on top of it, even if it's within the same organization or outside. But I don't see a lot of technologies we invested enough in that uh, aspect. Don't see a lot on top of my mind. I don't know from your point of view. It's one of those points that I, going back to what we were talking about before with, with the data mesh, even more with that, this is more of a framework than a technology point, I would say. It's mm -hmm. good practices. Yeah. At the end of the day, the biggest point that I see in all these things is that we're treating data as a product and we have data services at different gates of the data pipeline that need to happen. And so if there is a product before it passes that gate, yes. there needs to be clear ownership of what's happening, when it's expected to happen, and what's the end result that ends out of this gate. And that's, at the end of the day, that's the ownership that I think has been lacking. They're sort of, oh, it's kind of like a black box. Yes. The data comes out and I have my dashboard. And then I wake up in the morning when my dashboard isn't working. Exactly. But now we have clear gates where not only can we identify why it failed, but there's a sense of ownership. This is my team. I take care of this side of the data pipeline. The output is A, every morning at 8 a.m. And this is what I'm... I don't like the word data contracts just because it feels very corporate-y. Yeah. But uh, this is what I'm expected to do. And I think it makes it easier to recognize in which point things have failed. Perfect. So it does seems to be a trend from our point of view. Next one, scalability of AI. I guess this one... If I come understanding from where I took it on those different trends is the aspect of really embedding more AI into products. Ubiquity of AI, I think, is an interesting point because that is 1,000% a trend, especially after what's happening this year. Oh, yeah. That we're seeing more public use cases of AI in the forefront of the news every week. Leaders are going to be like, when am I getting my AI in my product? That AI might be something that's just, just a very simple linear regressions and then they'll just market it as AI. But that's definitely going to be a trend. On one side, because we have all these public use cases, like the Lenza app, uh, ChatGPT, but also because there has been a move technology-wise to make access to machine learning models simpler for non-technical teams to be able to create those machine learning models and def define AI. You're raising the key point here, right? You are making the barrier for adoption much lower or easier to go. And that's what it's making. Yes. There's a, the push side, the demand side. I'm expecting to see that rise. But it is true that right now yeah. you can actually go and create models if you are a subject matter expert. Hopefully you will have some statistical inference skills, but you actually don't need them to create yeah, yeah. models in some of the technologies that exist right now. Isn't that what AutoML is there to address? So that's one of, of the trend, basically, or another trend in, in this list. And it's highly linked to basically yeah. this one, I would say. There is a lot yes. of tools, yeah. a very popular one, where they really enable that and are yeah. very successful in this case. As you say, Ivan, it's pretty much not a given that if you take a bit of online course or if you have like a, a degree you can develop some sense of model and now the tools give you the ability to really check if this model is uh, or to reduce the bias in the model and all to make sure it can be applied from a scalable perspective and correct the model on the go uh, even now uh, quite uh, quite easily this is one of those where the cloud adoption has been a key factor for it, right? Because yeah, you have obviously. the computational power and even pre-trained models already that you can just leverage, as you mentioned, without being like a strictly a data science. Because AI traditionally has been the world of the data scientist, correctly so. But what I was seeing a lot is that 
projects would actually fail because there wasn't the input of the subject matter experts. And of all the things in data, AI and machine learning, they require an understanding or else we're just going to be looking at correlations and have no understanding of causation. Mm -hmm. Allowing to lower the technical barrier to AI has allowed more access or more co-creation between data science and subject matter experts. Yeah. That's a good thing. So the next potential data trend will be tiny ML and potentially a link to that small data. In case you don't know what is tiny ML, it is basically you have machine learning, which is using neural, neural network to, to recognize pattern in the data and apply that in various applications like object recognition, natural language processing, and as we discussed. Tiny ML will be basically a subfield of machine learning, but specifically enabling on very resource constrained and porous constrained uh, devices and that are cheap. So that's in the space of potentially IoT on your phone and many aspects that we may, might even, even think about. Or even more interesting, just running on unconnected device. That I find really interesting. And a series of unconnected devices that are able to run those algorithms and make better decisions and predictions. Let's let's look at windmills. I don't know. Uh, windmills, I have all of these little sensors. It's big, tiny data in a way because it's generating these sensors might be generating lots of data, but it's very it's uber localized and to be able to infer on those that I find really fascinating yeah. in a way that's disconnected from obviously from uh, cloud services, making it much more scalable in, in a way that I find I find that really exciting. I wonder how all those maybe depend on the application, but all those models can avoid bias in the long run. In many of those models, they're supposed to constantly learn, right? And they might create a bias because it's, as you say, super personalized, super specific for, for users. So all you can counter the potential bias that are going to be introduced. I'm guessing I don't have enough knowledge in terms of machine learning to, to be able to answer that. And there might be a, an answer on that. I guess our listeners will be happy to hear that Mark was the devil's advocate on this episode. <laughs> <laughs> <Just now. laughs> for, for once, it wasn't me. You know? For once, it wasn't Christian. <laughs> Bias is quite a, a, an important topic. I actually think that in this sense, that's, that's one of the few use cases in which it's a least of a concern because it's almost like bias is the product here. You want the bias because mm -hmm. it's uber localized in data intake and it's uber localized in data output. Like a lot of the danger you see with ethics in AI is that you are using a sample of data, but the impact of that AI model is going to impact a larger sample of the population. Yeah. And again, with Lenza, which is sort of top of mind right now, we've seen that. With can, can you define Lensa? What is Lensa? Oh, Lensa has been that app that's been used. Uh, we're recording this in December, so By the last uh, yes, <laughs> everyone that uses Instagram has seen a thousand of people that have used this um, AI models in this Lensa app to generate artistic images of themselves. So some of these, one of the things we've seen, as always happens in any AI use case right now, people of color that were using the Lensa app were getting those features. Uh, white oh, and there's yeah. a lot of other sort of um, ethical considerations uh, about this but using just this one as a, as a very very important example we're using a sample of data that's going to impact a large population if we look at tiny ml i find that really interesting because yeah. it's a localized sample of data with a localized output of data and i'm thinking a lot of sort of more industrial applications of it of obviously the human applications are the ones where the ethical impact is even bigger, but it's more exciting because it almost like it's the bias. The bias is what you want there because you're biasing for that place, for that microclimate. Well, if it'd been trained specifically on this user, yeah. But if it'd been trained on on another external data set initially, that's yeah, when yeah, you can that, see but that's that. that's a consideration with any AI in a way. Yeah. That's a great point. I will remember not that you really like the word uh, uber localized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know if it even exists. All right. Next one is BI, business intelligence. I was a bit uh, surprised to see it in the list. I don't think that is a trend. Uh, because BI has been in the data space and in organization for decades yeah maybe speaking about specific aspect of ai could be a data trend but bi on its own i wouldn't i wouldn't say so all right next one is data observability 
Data observability is a data ops process that takes into account the five key pillars of data health. Yeah. Freshness, distribution, volume, schema, and lineage. Um, so your data is being checked constantly. And you, you have, there is different products on the market. There is, uh, uh, I know Talent doing that. I know uh, Monte Carlo doing that. And I'm pretty sure there is a lot of other products tackling this one. I read somewhere that like in the software industry where SLA, service level agreements, what you expect as a minimum uptime for a service has to be 99.9. So that's the aspect of nines, how many nines? Yeah, you the accept. 11 nines or something. The trend is going towards where users, business users, expect some certain level of SLA for their data. So expect a certain level of freshness, volume, lineage, um, and basically the data being correct and ready for use all the time. It comes back to one of the points we discussed earlier. It depends on which organizations. For organizations that are already kind of ahead of the curves, that could be a very big topic at the moment. Yes, the observability of data to me should be part of those data contracts that we were discussing before, right? Out of that list that you mentioned, the one that stands out to me is the lineage. I think that is where I see the pain points most of the time. I think data observability should be there also to address the trust. Where is it coming from? So that's one angle. And the other one is the impact of what change. It is a trend, I believe, because of the um, cloud data warehouses, even though they they have disrupted the, the market, they also have made so easy mm. to bring data mm. that sometimes we end up with bad practices very easily. And because it's so easy now to connect to multiple sources of data, now it's becoming more and more important having that observability. It's the explosion of data that now we're kind of, the trends yeah. are how do we deal with it. <laughs> Because we have a lot of data and we have a lot of bad data. So that basically brings the topic of data catalog. This is not part of the data trends, but, but looking at those companies where they have so much data ingesting in their data warehouses, this is like a must have basically as part of their data stack. Yeah. Any enterprise organization needs to have a full visibility on all of the data assets that it has, period. Okay, next topic. Edge computing. Oh, yes. Ah, very strong uh, point of view. I see that as a trend yeah. where I work. Can you explain for, for the audience? Well, this is my understanding, by the yeah. way. <laughs> uh, uh, we'll see if I, I understand it in a different way. I have a point of view as well, but go ahead. Is the concept of not all of your data will be in the cloud yeah. and not all of your processes will be in the cloud. Let's say an assembly line, my manufacturing company, right, uh, where there is little to no, so zero connectivity, but I still want to, for example, deploy and run AI models because I would like to identify a defect based on, on taking an image of, the, of, of whatever uh, is being produced. So edge computing, I really think it's now a trend in the sense of um, the hype of going to the cloud is, is really down. It's down. It's now realizing, okay, you are the limitation. Exactly. I only see the major three players actually in playing in this market. I, I don't know any other maybe specialized companies, if you're aware, any of you. Uh, maybe we can uh, crowdsource those names from the community listening to the podcast. But I only know the major... Uh, infrastructure players doing edge computing. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't have a lot more, more to add to this. All right. So again, it's taken from different sources online. So last topic, augmented analytics. R augmented uh, analytics, that's the multiplication of synthetic data, right? What do they define as augmented analytics? I mean, in the Tableau world, <laughs> augmented analytics is basically those kind of little AI, ML that help you to, to make decisions. Explain data, uh, NLP, and things like that are in the bucket of augmented analytics okay. from Tableau perspective. Okay. Another example, perhaps, that I can bring is when, I don't know if you've seen cars lately, you can see on, while you're driving, you see on the windscreen the directions from Google Maps, for example, on where to turn, but you see it on the windscreen, not on, uh, on a screen. In that sense, I'm looking more, okay, I'm going to go to the shop and I have my like augmented reality glasses on. I'm going to look at the apples. Yeah. I'm going to look at the apples and it's going to tell me, oh, these apples are 15% above market average price in the shops in the two kilometer radius. This is fantastic application. And that's, I think, a great vision of augmented analytics where everyone, every yeah. consumer can, depending on the kind of situation they prompted, they see those kind of data 
uh, helping them to make decision. Long journey. I, I would say it's like more early trend that a real pure trend, growing trend at the moment. Because I do think there is a buzzword of like just adding analytics onto everything and be like, it's just, we're just consuming information. We're not analyzing anything yeah. unless there is an actual correlation of data that's, and the answer is going to give you, it is uber localized to your experience. Yeah. That for me is augmented analytics, but I haven't seen it at all, ever. Absolutely. Yeah. That was fantastic. And we have a question actually for you, Ivan. We asked that to each guest and I nearly forgot to ask you that. Uh, what is the most single important piece of professional advice you ever received? We asked that to every guest. I'd forgotten that you asked that to every guest because I was thinking about it a few days back that I need to think of a smart answer. And then I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I have, I have an answer for that. I'm not going to say it's an advice because it wasn't given to me as an advice, but it was almost a philosophy that I had in my team, which is it is better to say you don't know than to fake an answer to try and look smart, which is something that I think everyone here will be like, of course, all of us will admit when we don't know something. That's not true. A lot of us, when we're given a question that we're uncomfortable with, that we might not be fully secure in the answer, we try to put something together. And this was really interesting because it was in the DNA of our team at that moment is take that moment of not knowing something to actually establish rapport with the other person. Understanding there is there are ways and ways of admitting that you don't know something that actually makes you more human and allows you to build a relationship with the person on the other side. So that really became ingrained in the yeah. sort of the way that I work of very clearly I admit when I don't know something and I take action on it and use that as a moment to establish even sometimes as far as saying that is a really good question. I had never had that question before. I don't know the answer. Let's figure it out together. That's probably one, yeah, one of the, the things I, that has resonated with me the most throughout my career. Not as an advice, but as a, as a philosophy of, of work, especially in the world like pre-sales. Yeah, really good. Really good. I think this is a, a good place to leave things. You, you gave us a lot of ideas for future episodes actually there, Ivan. Right? Okay, Mark, that was fantastic. Fantastic time. Yeah. A lot to think about, a lot to unpack for everyone. Maybe you need to listen to this episode two, three times. <laughs> that was a <laughs> yes. lot of learning as well. And happy 2023, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode. This podcast represents our views and not the ones of our employers. Our mission at the Data Coffee Break podcast is to inform you and help you grow in this always changing data field. Follow us and get into the conversation with the community on our LinkedIn page and Instagram. See you next Tuesday. And until then, keep your data caffeinated. <laughs>